The Block Talk podcast started because of my passion for the property management industry. I wanted to start a conversation and add some value within the industry with a diverse range of people and professionals who can add something extra. As we start out, my aim is that the podcast offers some useful insight into a variety of views, opinions, thoughts, and foresights from our guests who include business leaders and industry experts. If you enjoy the podcast and want to find out any other information, head on over to brianwelsh.co.uk. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Block Talk podcast with me, Brian Welsh and Jax Bruce. Jax, how are you doing today? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Um, it's the aftermath of the PMAS dinner, um, which was Friday night last week. So that was that was a nice night. Nice to be out with the team. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Are you okay? Yes, I'm. I'm good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, I've spoken a couple of times actually on the podcast about having about installing Elon Musk Starlink on in in my house because my um, internet connection here is garbage. Um, so and so today, so we are. I'm at home. So uh, so this is going out over that. So if it sounds awful or if I get cut off or anything, you know, it's because of that. But actually. Um, you know, it has been really good and the speed's brilliant as well. So uh, so it has been really good over the piece. So hopefully today it'll be good too. Okay, so today um, um, it's International Women's Day on the 8th of March. So we're speaking to women in property management. Today we're talking to Karen Ann. Karen Ann works for CPL Software as Implementation and Training Manager. Um, Karen Ann's been working in the industry since she joined CPL in 2019. She comes from a teaching and education consultancy background, and as well as teaching, she's held a position as senior education consultant in the Scottish Schools Digital Network before she gave all that up and came to work for CPL. Um, so, hello, Karen. How are you doing today? Hi there. I'm good, thank you. I'm very good. Okay, so t- actually, tell us how you got into this industry then. Well, as you've just said, I've always worked in learning and development. So, and as you mentioned originally, an English teacher. And then I specialised while I was still teaching in support for learning. And that made me more interested in the impact that technology could have on learning at the time. And that just kind of really, without me seeking it out, sort of led me into a move on some software I'd been using um, in a school across several classrooms that I was in charge of implementing and that sort of led me into being asked by that company um, if I would interview for an education consultant role with them. So I did that and sort of worried about it but put my foot out of education so I was half in education half in a technology company but actually still in lots of different schools and that took me all over the UK so I did that and then it just kind of went on I worked in different countries so I worked in Australia um, for a while at one point in Brunei but mainly in Scotland and that eventually led me on to working um, in the Scottish Schools Digital Network so I've always worked to I guess in learning um, and then laterally in that part of my career in, in learning and development, which was really about getting teachers to understand how they could use technology um, to support learning. So all about digital learning and teaching really. Um, and, and laterally just through shifting of government contracts and things like that, I was working in a local authority the digital schools officer and that contract came to an end I knew when I took it on that it was a short-term contract and then I was left sort of looking for something um what did I want to do and it just seemed like a time in my life of well, what do I want to do do I want to go back into teaching do I want to look for a learning technologist post um and and just really being on LinkedIn and indeed and all the you know the recruitment sites looking for something um, you know, that was when I came across CPL and it just seemed more interesting than other training jobs. It just seemed, it may have been just the way you guys described it, but no, not at all. Um, it just seemed like 
you know that that seems more interesting it seems uh throughout the recruitment process which you obviously made quite hard mr welsh to make sure that you've got <laughs> the correct people in there um you know i got how passionate everyone was ab about it and it was just a smaller team so so it was really cpl that led me into working in this industry it was by being intrigued and interested in cpl and the position that was available um just seemed like a good point to come on board and fortunately you guys thought the same thing good good no that's interesting interesting to hear yeah because i mean we've we've in the past mainly taken people from a from industry and mm -hmm. and kind of and and then try to make them trainers yeah um do you know what i mean so so uh, and doing it the other way um has actually been more successful has actually been more successful it's like it's like taking people from i don't know another software kind of world and putting them in support whereas yeah you know sometimes the way to do it is to look for people who just have that customer service background and then teach them what you want them to support rather than yeah. the other way around you know so um so yeah this and, and, it, and i have to say it's been it's been working very well Good. Okay, Good. so you've become a bit of an expert in property management software then, um, which is great. Um, what do you think is the most beneficial aspect of having dedicated software? First of all, mm, would I say an expert? <laughs> There's still so much to learn. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure I would actually. I was doing some sort of internal training discussions this morning and we were speaking about the property manager aspects of things or the property property management company aspects of things so mm, not sure I'm an expert there is definitely still loads to learn but then I shock myself every now and then when I see how much I've learned um it's a difficult industry clearly it's a really difficult industry um you know what the our customers companies have to do and wrestle with on a daily basis um they shouldn't on top of that be having 600 spreadsheets um that they're trying to piece together and keep track of everything they need tools that have been written specifically for them and and that's really something again that attracted me to cpl and has definitely kept me here and interested is that this is specifically for property management block management this software and the more I see that it gets improved and expanded you know so all those it's not just people don't just need to know about money in money out they need to know the whole picture and they need to be able to support the whole picture for what their company does in terms of managing blocks and managing property whether that's grounds or buildings or whatever and you know, the fact that I see CPL get expanded for that and something gets written um, or developed for what they need to do and I can then introduce people to that, I think just makes a huge difference. I think if they have a piece of software that really works for exactly what they want to do, all the aspects of it, so they can go in there and they can see the single point of truth for what's going on, where are all the jobs sitting, where are all the proposed works? Where is the money that they're holding separately for them? How does that come on board? Where are all the invoices sitting, whether that's on an arrears basis or on an advanced basis? So the fact that all of that can sit together and that, uh, hi there, Arthur. The fact that all of that can sit together um, for them just blows me away that people have got something that it I know it's not it's not a bespoke product it's an off-the-shelf product but there's all these um switches and settings that can make it work for exactly what they need for it so um I think that's pretty essential in what is already a tough industry is that they have a piece of software that can do that for them Cool. Thank you. As you can as you can hear, Arthur entirely agrees with you. <laughs> of course, he does. Uh, my my um my office in the house or my study in the house has a big, well not big, has a, a kind of full length window that looks out over a kind of track, and I think he's seen he something. He spotted I, something. He's, he's, he's legged it somewhere anyway. I have no <laughs> idea where. Our, he's off to protect you there's certainly no car outside so i don't know what he's seen so uh, <laughs> although to be fair he was see we when we went for a walk earlier he saw some deer so uh, so so yeah that was interesting was that okay. the first time no no no. he um no see them quite often actually mm. um and in fact we've only lived here for about a month but 
Um, oh, he's back. So he obviously didn't see anything too exciting. Um, <laughs> we've only lived here for about a month, and apparently sometimes you'll see them in the garden in the morning. I don't know. We've not we've not come across. Wow. That. We've definitely seen them up in the woods when we've been taking him for a walk. That's fantastic. Um, so no, that was really interesting. That's really interesting, and it's good to get somebody else's take on it because you know uh, the, the software is there so that you can take away a lot of the mundane tasks but it's also yeah. there to give them give them a huge amount of information or give problem management managers a huge amount of information that allow them to do their job more effectively so yeah and yeah. that's what we strive for and the fact that it can automate so many things for them and that does get expanded upon as we go along the number sure. of things that can be automated with all their checks and balances still there where they need to be then i think just makes a, a big difference to people or that's what i see when i'm yeah. introducing people to it Good, 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 good. Okay, he's laying down in the sun now, so with any luck, we'll not get any more interruptions from <laughs> our... What do we call him, Jax? What's he on our website? Us? CPO. CPO. What does that sound cute, for? Cute puppy officer. All right, okay. 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 He was very cute this morning. He was band bounding about in the in the uh, uh, when I took him for a walk. Um, okay, so, so moving swiftly on and off the Arthur subject... Um, <laughs> What's been the most challenging aspect of your time in, in property management industry so far? Um, I guess just, so a couple of things, but definitely getting my head around the size and the scope of our main product offerings. So, um, you know, all the different aspects of that. But then at the same time, I was getting my head around how that industry operates. My only experience with that industry previously has been, um, you know, living in a flat in Glasgow years ago and and having one of our customers as um, as our property management or property factoring company. So um, understanding all the different aspects of that, and I'm constantly surprised or what, have been surprised since 2019 at all the stuff that they have to deal with. Um, then the biggest challenge has been getting my head around the software, everything they have to deal with. So all the touch points from there about where uh -huh. our software can support what they're doing um, so that I can deliver the correct and the needed training and support materials and keep building on the ones we have available so that that hits the right spot. Um, possibly a big challenge is definitely making sure that we get the onboarding uh, or the implementation process correct for new customers when they come on board with us so that we're again hitting that at the right point for where they're coming from where they want to get to with CPL and us finding the right path for them and having it all configured correctly so that they get the best out of that so yeah the biggest challenge is getting that up and off the ground and 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 definitely on the knowledge base front that we've tried to create I mean, it's a challenge between doing the new implementations and making sure that we're still getting training guides um, written and webinars, training sessions out for people so that we've got all of that on our knowledge base so that people can access it when they need it. Because it's, <laughs> I've been asked many times, can I have the CPL training manual? <laughs> If only there were one huge one, it would certainly be giant. But and of course, that's not really what people need. They need all the different bits that are about how they use it and what they could do with it. And the number of times I train people and have them realise, well, I didn't know that was there at all. You know, people don't know what they don't know. So it's it's getting enough support materials there and things delivered in a way that can allow that to happen. Another. Um, of what I find a big challenge is how long it can take. The kind of training I would like to do is one where they have lots of, we have lots of kind of scenario based stuff where they get to try things out while it's happening. But, you know, we have to go with the time that our customers have for training and what training they can pay for if they're looking for that later on, further down the line. Um, and, a lot of our training sometimes ends up being show and tell. And I'd like oh. to move it on from being show and tell, but that's a big time commitment for the customers that we work yeah. with. Yeah. So, yeah, I find that a big challenge. 
Mm, okay, maybe see. I mean, I, I guess the way to do that possibly in the future is to do it um, globally. Um, yeah. And what I mean by that is for, for everybody rather than specific people. Because yep. you're right, because they don't, there's a cost implication, but there's also a time implication the, away from their That's from bigger. Their, the time implication is well. bigger. Yeah. 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 Mm, food for thought. Food for thought. Um, it was actually quite interesting. You mentioned something there about, you know, you'd, you'd um, had exposure to, to a, a property factoring company previously um, when you lived in a flat in Glasgow. Yeah, but then you've learned so much more about what they do since you've worked for CPL. I think that's one of the biggest challenges yeah. in the industry at the moment. I've seen it's something that a lot of people have touched on. Um, Changing in perceptions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, David David Reed, I think when he was on, mentioned a lot about um, educating first time buyers and also people who are downsizing. Yeah, because, they, because these are the two kind of. Um, areas of people or um, demographics of people who have never encountered a factor before. No, and they don't have any appreciation of everything that's involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's tough. (laughs) Really Mm. tough. It's a big Mm. mountain. Yeah. So has there been a project that's interested you most in the last two or three years? Um, I wouldn't say one project, and definitely in the knowledge base, it's uh-huh. been, yeah, and I mentioned that a bit in the last one, definitely the knowledge base and getting that off the ground and getting some stuff in there, um, guides that are going to be useful to people. Um, that's certainly been part of a huge learning curve for me. So getting that off the ground, but it still needs love and attention and enough time to give it that love and attention um, to make it even more useful. That's certainly been great. But the um, what really interests me is new customers when they come on board um, and and where how we manage to take them. So even though they all come from the same industry, they all come from different perspectives. They come from different backgrounds in terms of the tools that they're using and how they conduct. I know there's the Property Factoring Act, certainly in Scotland, um, and legislation in England, and that influences how they have to conduct themselves. But there are still lots of different things that they do in different ways. Um, And so it's being able to build that bridge so that we can in CPL software and part of building that bridge is the whole implementation um, process for them. So what are all the, the the on and off switches that we can configure different parts of the software so that it does what they need it to do, um, but also letting them see where they can get to and what they can do and bringing them on board without them thinking that I'll just do the same as I did before here, because maybe you can do things a lot better than you did before. Now, there's obviously some recognition of that because they've come to CPL looking at that product and looking at what they want to do. But I find that whole process really interesting and 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 the worry about getting that right, very challenging. But yeah, I mean, we are starting to get good and certainly I'm starting I suppose to for myself to get good feedback in there in terms of what's happening and how we're doing that but it's it's not really one project it's I suppose if you saw implementation and then um, the knowledge base are the two things that that really kind of keep me going and keep me really interested and and wanting to get out of bed to do it yeah okay no that's that that is that is hugely interesting I mean you know there's I I, I have to say that um, 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 a bit like you, I, 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 I look forward to getting out of bed in the morning and go to work, you know, and I, there's a lot of people who maybe can't say that, you know, so it, it yeah. is, it is interesting to do it. I, I have to say that, I mean, I've been in the software industry for about, gosh, God, 30, 32 years. And one of the biggest challenges is an, an industry that works in, different ways yeah um, and I mean I came from a originally a legal software background and I still I still have a hand in legal software as well um, and that is so strictly um, you do it this regulated that yeah there's not I mean how many switches do we have in CPL now four or five hundred of the things yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so you know uh, in in uh, I, I, I don't know how many are in our legal software products I'm not that close to it but you know I would guess 10 percent of what we have 
But yeah. and, you know, and 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 my legal software firm has about a thousand firms, whereas CPL has about forty clients. You know, so so you know, there's four hundred, four five hundred switches to make the software do different things yeah. for specific people. You know, um, and it is very much like that. So it, it can be, I guess, um, implementations can be fairly challenging to to work out what of those switches people you know people want and how they want their, the the software to act for them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then once they're using it, though, as well, there's still a level of implementation, isn't it? Because mm. it, it's back to that you don't know what you don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, once we've got a customer who's up and running with us and if they, you know, maybe they've got new people on board who haven't appreciated that that can do it that way or something didn't get passed over or they just got told something in training and because it's more show and tell because that's what there was time for that didn't sink in or come on board and and maybe they need to change that further down the line so it's maintaining that contact and I think the the webinars that we've been able to deliver that started since lockdown you know and we had a program of them and then last year we had a monthly sort of free webinar session I think that's been really good to sort of maintain those kinds of things of ah you know, you get them come back to you and say, right, okay, can you tell me more about this now? Because the webinar is just a taster of it. Right, I didn't yeah. know we could do that or we're not using that part. Yeah. How, how do we get set up to use that part? So, yeah, it's about it's not just about the, the national onboarding, isn't it? It's about yeah. how, how do we make sure they're getting the best from the software that's there? Do they know about all the stuff? So, yeah, that's yeah. really valuable. Yeah, okay, interesting, interesting. Um. Okay, so my last question for you before we go on to Jax's questions. Um, if you could give a piece of advice to any woman, uh, any women out there who are starting a career in the industry, what would you tell them? I, it just seems like quite a tough industry. So I think anyone, women and men, if, I mean, it certainly seems, when I look at our customers, it seems like quite a balanced industry. We do have a lot of women in that industry already. Um, so what would I tell them? I guess just qualities or concentrating on things like persistence and having the courage of their convictions, but also having a general resilience because it does seem like quite a tough industry. You know, listening to the podcast from some great women who work in our customers or um, work in other organisations, that seems to be they've, they've, they've definitely had the courage of their convictions and they know when resilience is actually required but I think if you've got those things there are certainly lots of opportunities for women in the property management sector um, there's obviously in terms of the work that's carried out by our customers there's a lot of understanding of and skill um, that's needed to relate to people you know it's about knowing when to step back and listen and knowing when to reflect on what their company's doing and right. that's that's key for us we need to do a lot of listening to our customers to our new customers and our existing customers um and we need to reflect on what we are doing i certainly need to reflect on what i'm doing in training and how we can do that better and um, there's a lot of people around me and cpl you and crawford and Jax and Will and Sarah, who are you know, our support teams or developers, who are keen to do things the best way, and and just having the courage to look at it and change it when you need to do it differently, you know, just because it's always been done a certain way doesn't mean it should continue. So I think for women coming into the industry, you need to be quite resilient. But you need to, in my mind, everyone always needs to be a reflective practitioner. You need to question what you're doing. Uh -huh. and then see how you can do it better. Um, obviously, sticking on in there, not losing your temper and throwing your toys out the pram is definitely something that's going to take you further. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for those. Thanks for answering those questions for us. Right, Jax, over to you for your three quirky questions. Great, thank you. Yes, Karnan, this is the the point at which I jump in um, with some fun things to ask you. <laughs> um, so what's your biggest failure across your entire career and what did you learn from it? Oh, I really struggled with this. 
<laughs> in terms of uh, not not that I'm saying my my career is full of failures, but I've certainly been learning from <laughs> I things. It was the opposite that you've not had <laughs> no, any. No. Um, no, there were definitely things I could pull on, and even asked my husband, "What have I wittered to you about that has been my greatest failure in this career?" Um, no, I think something that sprung to mind when I was first realizing that I was going to be interviewed for this and, and listening to the other podcasts and what other people have done um, and talked about then uh, I was working in Australia at one point um, for a software company that um, did software and interactive whiteboards for use in education and as part of that job I spent some time in New Zealand and we were heading to Singapore just to sort of spark some things off there um, and we had a sort of local contact person in Singapore who was trying to gather some business for us and, and me going out there was to be able to speak to lots of people um, and she had arranged some visits and so I basically she was there met me at the airport and we headed off in a taxi to a school um, where we were speaking to people straight away bit of a long flight to be doing that but anyway that's what we were doing um, and it, it, it kind of slowly dawned on me that that person as our local contact uh, had lots of her own agendas um, in terms of what she was trying to set up for herself and the importance of her position within that as our, our kind of local consultant um, and that maybe wasn't what I was discovering is that that wasn't in the best interest of our company or what we were trying to do and the information we were trying to get out there. So, um, yeah, I kind of quickly learned what I should have known. Um, she came with me to the hotel room and uh, said she would quite like to check it out because she had had an influence in how good the room was. And she came in, looked at the room, used the bathroom in my hotel room before when I was just checking in. That should have been a sign for me that th <laughs> things weren't going to go that well. Um, and so what did I learn from that? Well, I, I certainly learned to be resilient. I learned to be courageous and say, um, find the best ways not really of contradicting her but presenting our company and what we were doing in the best light and, and trying not to be really obvious when she had clearly lied and tried to make us sound better than we were and actually we were really good <laughs> what we were doing was really good we didn't need that to be happening so I certainly found that a challenge um, so I suppose I've really learned to hold fast to know about uh, what I'm good at, um, what I know I can do, what I know I can feel proud of, and and what I can feel proud of in the company I'm working with. So, uh, yeah, it, it certainly marked me. I think the, the experience of that week, um, and and told me what what I should be setting out to do, and and also what I should be arranging beforehand for those kinds of things. So, how much information can you find out beforehand? So, yeah, sorry, a bit of a complicated answer, but no, not so cool. That's interesting. Um, so, if you ruled the world for a day, what would you do? Yeah, oofed this one. So I do want to obviously say lots of things about countries and governments and everything that lots of other people want to say, but I'm going to choose to say something else instead. Um, so what would I do? Uh, I would make sure that there was free instrumental education and um, tuition for every child that goes to school because who who wants that? Who wants to take that up, obviously? children should get the opportunity for it um, because that made a big difference to me when I was at school myself and you know although I went away from playing um, the clarinet for years I now I'm in an, an amateur orchestra and, and it, it kind of shaped me into the person I was and it gave me lots of opportunities when I was younger um, and certainly my parents would really have struggled to pay for um instrumental tuition so making I think making sure that everyone has the opportunity to do that so that they can be creative and the, and that they can also grow in that way music's certainly another language so 
Um, it, I think as children are developing, then music really helps the way their brains work and how they learn. So, yeah, I, I could talk about this for ages and I won't. So that's what I would do. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's, it's something that's kind of... I think it depends what school you go to, doesn't yeah. it? And how focused music is. I mean, I learned the recorder when I was at school, you know, that was the extent of it. Yeah, um, it's always a good starting point, but yeah, I don't want to diss the recorder, but yeah, it does. It depends on what school you go to. Yeah. It depends on what um, local authority you go Absolutely. to, certainly in Scotland, and and there, when there are cutbacks to be made. Yeah. You know, it's tough for councils and local authorities in education deciding where the money is going to go, but when there are cutbacks to be made, that's often something that suffers from it. And I think... I think it's a, a short-term fix that has a bit of a long-term legacy, a mm -hmm. negative legacy, if you yeah. make cutbacks there. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Excellent. And when you're 70 um, and you look back at your life, what will you be glad you did or feel proud of, either something you've done already or something you still want to do? Yeah, I find this really hard as well to decide <laughs> what to say. You, you say this. Jack, as if these are really, you know, here's the quirky part, but actually the thinking that goes into that, what can I say that I won't sound an idiot? What do I really feel? Uh, yeah, yeah. So they're good. They're good questions. I think oh, it's kind of overgeneralizing it and I don't want to make it sound grander than it is. But if I, feel, if I can feel that I've made a difference to the way you know, working's such a big part of people's, of all of our lives. Um, and, you know, Brian, what you were saying earlier, if you don't enjoy that, if you can't get out of bed because you want to do that, um, then it's a, a pretty poor show and it will be a, a, a long career maybe of misery. But if I, in terms of what I do, whether it was when I was working as an education consultant or working as a teacher or what I do now in terms of training and implementation, if I can make a change and make things a little bit easier for people, mm -hmm. a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more, if there are more sort of ah, sort of epiphany moments of that's how I should do that, um, then that, that's, I'm happy. That, that, that's it for me, you know, if I've made that bit of a difference. I don't think people will go to their grave saying it was that woman that trained me, but... <laughs> but, but you never know, you never know. <laughs> God, God help them. Um, but, uh, yeah, if it, if it makes little differences on the way along to people, then, you know, that, that's what I'll feel proud of. Yeah, nice. Cool, thank you. Not at all. Bye. Karen, thanks very much. That's been absolutely fabulous um, to talk oh, to you good. and to get Thank that you. information out of you. That was great. Um, uh, good, good answers. And yeah, it was that was I, I learned a lot in that actually. To be fair, and considering I've worked with you for a good number <laughs> of years, now, maybe I should have known some of those things. But yes. uh, we're also busy but, working. That's why. Yeah. No. But uh, but no. Thank thank you thank you very much. And, no, um, cool. Yeah. Thank you.